is God and can we truly know him? Over the last 2,000 years, we've tried to envision him, sometimes even to the point of contorting him to fit into our box. Because of our limited imagination, we can fail to grasp a limitless God, a God who is three distinct persons, but yet one, not only a Father, but a Son and a Holy Spirit. But can we truly know who God is? Can we relate to him and trust him the way a child trusts a father? As deep cries to deep, we all long to connect with our creator. Knowing who God is doesn't just depend on us. He has already made a way for us to know him. What if he can be known by his voice and his spirit and his word and his creation? God is beyond our imagination, yet he invites us to come to him, to know him and to walk with him. This is how we truly come to know who God is. I'm going to ask you a favor. I don't know if you can do this or not. It might be a bit of a challenge, but I'm going to ask you to be still. Not for the next 30 minutes while I preach or the rest of the day, but for the rest of your life. Can you do that? I know that's a big ask. I know it's going to be hard, but it's also in the Bible. So I think I'm good. I can say that. Scripture says, be still and know that I am God. Now, I'm not saying you could sleep today. I just want you to be still. Now, it should be easy for those who hardly do any talking to be still. A little more difficult for the others who make up for the ones who don't talk, who say nothing. But that's not anyone here, right? Anyways, I'm not just talking about stop talking to be still, but knowing God in that stillness. And that's part of the big idea of being still. And know that he is God. Our text today is Psalms 46 verse 10. A familiar verse to you. And I'm going to look at a couple other verses in that chapter as well. I don't think the psalmist had in mind one moment of silence that is going to do you for the rest of your life. As if you have that special experience and then you just ride the wave for the rest of your life. There's more to it than that. You just don't check off the box and say, well, I had that God experience many, many, many years ago, so I'm good. I'm okay. I don't have to be still anymore. I've got this all under control. The psalmist wasn't thinking uh, just a one-time thing, but I believe any time necessary, a daily thing, a momentary thing, whenever you are in a tight space or facing difficulties or you're not sure what to do, the psalmist is talking about knowing God personally even in the worst situations in times of your life. Be still and know. I was thinking about this. Know in his knower, his mind, but also knowing in his heart. I pray that today, if you are full of Bible knowledge, that's great, but that it also click in your heart, that in your mind and in your heart and in your spirit, that God would be even more real to you, that he would show up in your life, even as I preach, that you would just open the doors And let him do what his Holy Spirit wants to do in your life today. Because life can be difficult. And in the worst times it can be confusing. And there's threats and there's challenges and there's loss. There's the unknown. And we should be still. That's the very best thing that we can do. Because then we know God. The psalmist is saying. Let me just highlight a couple of verses there. Verse 1 and 2. God is our refuge and strength. A very present help in trouble. Therefore we will not fear, even though the earth be removed, and though the mountains be carried into the midst of the sea. Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. May God bless the reading of his word today. There's a couple key thoughts there I just want to highlight. And the first is this, a tight space. The psalmist calls God a very present help in trouble. And the Hebrew word translated trouble literally means a tight space. Have you ever been in a tight space where you are pressed in on every side, where your options were limited, your freedom was restricted? There seemed to be nowhere to turn, nowhere to go. You were stuck, you were fearful, you were lost, you were put in the corner, not knowing what to do. I was thinking back in my life, and I remember as a kid, I had to be about maybe six years of age. We lived in the country, we had a farmhouse, and my dad added a double garage with an apartment over it. Because my dad was sponsoring my uncle Hank to come over from Holland. So he needed a place to stay. 
And so Warner Construction became Warner Brothers Construction as Hank and my dad Peter formed that company and they worked together. Uncle Hank got married, so they needed that place to stay. Now, I loved construction stuff. I loved finding all the little nooks and crannies. I liked just checking it all out. And so this one day, I remember very clearly, while my parents were eating and Uncle Hank and Tante Cindy were there, and they were all down in the old part of the farmhouse, I thought, I'm going to go check what they're doing. And so I went up by myself. They didn't know where I was. And the trusses that came down where the walls were, my dad created a, a, a storage space. So there's a little knee wall there. And then you have that cool little hiding place. And in that hiding place, there's also trusses even behind that, right by the wall that was like this wide, a little triangle. I thought, I wonder if I can crawl through that. It'd be sort of fun. <laughs> so I did up to a point, And guess what? I got stuck. No one knew where I was. No cell phones. I didn't have a whistle. There's, I thought, what am I going to do? I tried to move forward, backwards. I thought, the only way I'm going to get out is a miracle. I thought, I'm going to miss supper. I'm going to miss chores. Well, it wasn't that bad. <laughs> I was going to miss a night's sleep in my bed. My parents would be missing. They'd be looking all over the place. They would not find me there until much, much later. So you know what I did in that tight space? I prayed. I prayed an uh, age six prayer. God help me. And I was, I was able to wiggle out. I was so relieved. I put myself in that situation. I'm glad I got out. It was a tight space. But maybe there have been times that you've put yourself in a tight situation spiritually. A poor decision. Hanging out with the wrong crowd. Doing life on your own. Thinking you could handle it. That you don't need anyone else. You don't have to be accountable or responsible or whatever. You're just going to do your thing. Even as a Christian, a lone Christian. But we need one another. So maybe you put yourself in a situation, a tight space. Or it just happens. Sometimes life can just work out like that. There's the good, the bad, and the ugly in life. And you may find without any fault of your own that you're in a corner or you're in a tight space. And you don't know what to do. So with that tight space idea... There's a couple of things. There's uncontrollable circumstances that are beyond our control. Verse 2 says, We will not fear even though the earth be removed and even though its mountains be carried into the midst of the sea. Describing a natural disaster involving storms, seas, and earthquakes. We had a tornado here a number of years ago. When I was a kid in Barrie, I was uh, 17. And we lived outside of Barrie. And a tornado came through. I was getting my hair cut. It all went dark. And the tornado just ripped through Barry. And wow, the devastation, uncontrollable. It really rocks your faith, doesn't it? Then there's 9-11 that happened. There's so many things that happened. The tornado here in Godrich and just earthquakes, these natural things that happen. And, and you think, why is this happening? So there's those issues. In the Old Testament cosmic geography, the earth was thought to be set upon pillars that reached to the very bottom of the subterranean ocean where the mountains were rooted as well. And the word picture here of the earth and its mountains collapsing in the sea is equivalent to an under, undoing of its foundational structure of creation, separation of land and sea. And the psalmist imagines the most catastrophic disaster that might challenge the faith of those trusting in God. It's quite the word picture. Even if all that happens, the creation that I see, the mountains that seem to be so solid, and the earth that's on pillars going all the way down to the bottom, even if the foundation was to let all that stuff crumble and fall to pieces. Even then, I'm going to trust in God. I'm going to be still. I'm going to know that he is God. So because God is my help, I will not fear when the foundations are shaken, the psalmist is saying. When we face circumstances which we have no control over, God is still our refuge. When we take a look at all the tragedies that happen around the world, the natural disasters. We think, God, why are you allowing this? Well, our world is broken. We are safe, people of faith. We understand that it's going to be made all new again. But until then, this broken world is going to have more of that happening. So the psalmist is getting the big picture. Then there's also the opposition that he faces. Verse 8 and 9, the psalmist speaks of wars, bows, spears, and chariots. And he's saying, when I face an army against which I have no ability to fight, I will not be afraid because God. Because God is my refuge and strength. He will fight for me. 
Pastor Scott's message last week was a great message and a real encouragement. When unexpected things happen, God is there. He spoke about Elisha and the Ramians before him, and he knew that he was not alone. Elisha knew that he was not alone. His servant had to experience that and find out that God would provide for him and for his spiritual eyes to be opened and the host of angels surrounding them, protecting them, caring for them. That made all the difference for Elisha's servant. The next thought in this, this chapter is a mighty fortress. Verse 1, God is our refuge and strength. Martin Luther actually used this psalm as the basis for his amazing hymn, A Mighty Fortress is Our God. Do you remember that hymn? We don't sing that very often, but there's a hymn book there in front of you at the end of the service if you want to find it in there and read those, those verses. It comes out of Psalms 46. A mighty fortress is our God. God uses troubles, I believe, to help us say, I don't know what to do. Which is okay to admit once in a while, isn't it? After all, we're just human. I am as well. And there's those times that I come to that place, I just don't know what to do. And it's important to say that to God. Why? Because he always knows what to do. And I think it's good for a Christian to humble ourselves and say, we don't have it all together. We don't have all the answers. We struggle through things. I don't know what to do. We don't know what to do. But God does. See, we're determined people who want to come up with the answers ourselves so we can feel good about ourselves so we don't have to let God in to our situation maybe. We want to control our lives, control our situations. And there's many lessons then that have to be learned the hard way when we do that and we leave God out of the situation. Maybe we're faced with decisions that need to be made and out comes the legal pad and you divide it in half, you draw that line and then you start doing the pros and cons and and, uh, the effects, the outcomes and then you make a decision based on paper and what you've written down. We sometimes act as if we don't need God but we will never really know him until we humbly acknowledge that we do. When we come to that place where we say we don't know what to do but our eyes are on you. If you have your Bibles, you can turn to 2 Chronicles chapter 20. The account is there. It's an actual prayer of King Jehoshaphat of Judah. And he's faced with invasion. And he's leading the nation in prayer. And he says this, O our God, we have no power to face this vast army that is attacking us. We do not know what to do, but our eyes are on you. So when problems are so big, when there's an enemy all around us, what do you do? You look up and you call out, And you focus on him. And God is always there. He doesn't just show up. He's always there. We need to attend to him. We need to focus on him. We need to look up to set our eyes on him. If you're facing uncontrollable circumstances or opposition today, are you willing to say, Lord, I don't know what to do. I don't have the answers, but I'm looking to you. You are my refuge. You're my strength. Even though I'm in a tight spot, I'm going to pray. I'm going to trust you. And God replied through the prophet Jehaziel in verse 15. Listen, King Jehoshaphat and all you who live in Judah and Jerusalem. This is what the Lord says to you. Do not be afraid or discouraged because of this vast army. For the battle is not yours, but God. You will not need to fight for this battle. Take up your positions. Stand firm and see the deliverance the Lord will give you. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. Go out to face them tomorrow and the Lord will be with you. See, God is our refuge. He can protect you on the outside. God is our strength. He can strengthen you on the inside. He's our refuge and strength on the outside and inside. He's with us. He is for us. And we face it together with him. Look at verse 4. There is a river whose streams make glad the city of God, the holy place, where the Most High live. In the application study Bible says this, many great cities have rivers flowing through them, sustaining people's lives by making agriculture possible and facilitating trade or with other cities. Jerusalem didn't have a river, but it had God who, like a river, sustained the people's lives. As long as God lived among the people, the city was invincible. But when the people abandoned him, God no longer protected them, and Jerusalem fell to the Babylonian army. Jerusalem didn't have a river flowing through it, but they had God, which was better than the river. Other nations, other cities had rivers that would go through and they would attach a deity to that river and they would, they would think and believe that that deity 
And that water was the source of life and would protect them and do all that they wanted. But how much better than the physical river is the river of God, the psalmist is saying. God's river, his grace flows freely. His glory is made known. His power is in his people. So we can know and experience this by being faithful to him, by finding God to be our refuge in strength and ever-present help in trouble. Aren't you glad when you're in a tight spot, you're having trouble, that God doesn't have to say, well, I can only spend like 30 seconds here with Brian. I got to take care of Bill. I got to take care of Maureen. And I'm just going to have to spread myself out really, really thin to cover everyone. No, he shows up in power for everyone full force all the time whenever you need him. There's a divine strategy that the psalmist talks about. And this is our part as well. See, we get help from God by being still. Sometimes we're so busy that we can't stop. Here it is, Labor Day weekend. You get tomorrow off, hopefully. Our lives can be so busy and you think, I just need that break. I just need a bit of relief. Think about the pace of life, especially those that have kids. You're driving them everywhere, here, there, and everywhere. Every minute that they're awake, they seem to have needs, and they dominate your time, and they need you as parents. And so you do it because you love them and care for them. But I remember those years. Those are busy times. Enjoy them. The pace of work never seems to slow down. Tomorrow will be activity to activity. The phone might not stop ringing. You might get a whole bunch of texts, a whole bunch of emails, and you just got to try and keep up with it. Your week may be a blur until next Sunday. When do you stop and smell the roses? If that's even possible, who has time for that? Remember when one of your kids were hurt? What were they doing? They are running all over the place, screaming and crying, and you just had to say what? Stop running around and be still for just a moment so you could attend to them, so you could look in their eyes, so you could see what the problem is, so you could spend that time with them, so you could help them. Aren't we like that with God? He's saying just stop running around, stop screaming, stop crying, just be still and know that I'm God. I want to spend that time with you. I need to do something in your life Forget about the circumstances. Forget about being in a tight spot. It's now me and you. We need that moment together where you're going to be still. Where you're going to quiet yourself. Where I have your attention. Where you have my attention. When did we forget that God is God? When he should be our first go-to when times are tough instead of a last resort. The psalm is a good reminder for us. We need to rest. How many remember kindergarten? Okay. What was the best part of kindergarten? Tell me. What's that? Nap time. Oh, I went to school for nap time. Because if I stayed home, I, my mom would find chores for me to do, for sure, on the farm. But the best part of kindergarten was nap time. I loved it. I even, I I missed it when I went to grade one, too. I tried it in high school, Mr. Burnell's chemistry class or physics class. And I I was near the back, so I thought I could get away with it. You know, they had the nice stools, and you could just lie down. And I sat behind a big guy, so he couldn't see me. Then all of a sudden, I'm napping, enjoying it, and it got quiet. And that's when teachers had the really big, long meter sticks. So it went really quiet. I thought, this is really odd. I wonder what's going on. And he was about to slam it on the desk to wake me up. And I popped my head up (laughs) just in time. Mm -hmm. That would have been like a wake-up call. I never fell asleep again. That was a close one. Now, I think life would be better if more people took naps. That's just my opinion, don't you? (laughs) I even took a nap during my sermon preparation, just being honest. I felt a little better afterwards, and I could keep on doing it. Now... Don't take a nap now. Uh, Wait till you get home. Sunday naps, aren't they great? I grew up also with Sunday naps. You probably did as well. We called it the Pentecostal nap. But if you're a Baptist and you had a Baptist nap, I'm sure it was just as good or united or whatever it is. A nap time in Sunday doesn't hurt you at all. I give you permission. Guys, I give you permission to have a nap this afternoon. So being still is not a bad thing. and, And maybe... It's the most important thing to do spiritually. When life all around us is crazy and upside down, to be still. 
To be still means to cease striving, to stop working at it, to relax. Maybe that's not something you're good at, being still. Stop working or relaxing, but, but do it and let God be God. See, God's strategy is countercultural, the opposite of how we would handle it. We need to slow down enough to be still and know that he is God. Mother Teresa said this, Listen in silence, because if your heart is full of other things, you cannot hear the voice of God. Our life can be so cluttered with stuff, with other things, even our heart, that if we don't quiet ourselves down, we can't hear the voice of God. Maybe we need to simplify our lives. Rest. Quit some things. Pray more. Read the Bible. Release our cares in God's hands. I want to look at the idea of be still and tie in another scripture, a familiar scripture, Isaiah 30, verse 15. It says this, In repentance and rest is your salvation. In quietness and trust is your strength. There is such a thing as, as too much noise, noise pollution. It's one of the biggest problems in some of these countries that are so um, close-knit and, and so busy population just crammed into skyscrapers. When we were in Holland many years ago, the busiest airport in Europe was restricted from flying certain hours of the evening because of the noise level. There were restrictions put on. Noise is defined in Webster's Dictionary as to sound loud, loud making a great sound obtrusive. Here's a couple of things for you to think about just on volumes of things. Rustling of leaves is about 20 decibels. Conversational speech is about 60 decibels. Hearing damage occurs at 85 decibels if it's prolonged. A jetliner overhead at 500 feet has a decibel rating of 115. Rock music with amplifiers is rated at 120 decibels, which is also the noise level of the human pain threshold. Which is why people cry out in pain, they fall on the ground, and they rock and roll with that music. Probably didn't know that. But here's a fun fact. Country music pain threshold is much lower than rock and roll. I just offended all the people who like country. <laughs> well, anyways, that's just my point of view. So if you like country, go for it. I actually like some country, especially when it sounds more like rock and roll. I like rock and roll. Anyways, there's a lot of noise out there. We need a quiet place. And the quietest place on earth, naturally speaking, is from the Microsoft um, company. They built a room that's now officially designated in the Guinness Book of Records as the quietest place on earth. Dubbed the Antiochic Chamber. It's located at the company's headquarters in Redmond, Washington. Now, the people who study all these quiet rooms, the quietest rooms, they say you can hardly stand it when you're in that room. And you can get tours, I think, for $200 for a tour, a 90-minute tour, which includes a 20-minute uh, time in that quietest place. But in this chamber, it said that when you go in, you become the sound. Just think about that for a moment. You hear your heart beating. There's nothing else in that room except you. You are the sound. And the experience can be so disconcerting, they say, that no one has ever survived a visit of longer than 45 minutes in a room like that. You just go crazy. You just got to get out. It's that quiet. And I was thinking man can eliminate noise, but they can't create perfect quietness for any length of time. They can't. Why? Because the heart is restless. The heart will never be at peace without God. It'll always be searching for something. And when you're in a quiet place and it's just you and you hear your heart without God, you can't stand it. You can't even stand there, stand yourself, so to speak. Which actually points to a reality. We are not the answer. We can't do life by ourselves. We need to be still and we need to know that he is God. So God comes into the quietness of our moments, even in the midst of storms, and he fills it with himself. And that's when we find that rest. That's when we have that place of refuge. That's when we have that place of security. 
God creates the quietest place in the world. It's not a building or anything which man can make, but it's within our heart. Isn't that what you need today? When you're going through a difficult time and you quiet yourself, you just need to know that you're his, that he loves you, and that he is with you. And there could be storms all around you, but yet he can speak to your mind and touch your heart, and he can have that quietness. Author Calvin Miller writes, the secular noise that chokes our spiritual life produces nothing. There's a lot of noise out there, but it produces nothing. Instead, let's go for the quietness that God can do something. And your task then is to filter out all the noise and distractions that would choke your faith and apply only what is good, beneficial, and godly in your life. To let God's word speak to your mind and become real in your life. And then you'll find that quietness. You'll experience God. Chuck Swindle comments about the quietness that we need today. He says this, You know something? That still small voice will never shout. God's methods don't change because we uh, are so noisy and busy. He is longing for our attention, your individual, undivided and full attention. He wants to talk to you in times of quietness about your need for understanding, love. Compassion, patience, self-control, a calm spirit, genuine humility, wisdom. But he won't run to catch up. He will wait and wait until you finally sit in silence and listen. Isaiah 26, verse 3 to 4. I love this verse. You will keep in perfect peace those whose minds are steadfast because they trust in you. Trust in the Lord forever, for the Lord, the Lord himself, is the rock eternal. See, God still speaks to those who listen. You might think, God, where are you? When you quiet yourself down, you will know that he is God and realize he's always been there. You just weren't paying attention. You weren't letting him in to your life and to your situation, your circumstances. Maybe we should ask God to quiet the noise in our busy hearts so we could hear his voice. So be still. And then the next word is no. No, not just in your mind, but also in, the, in your experience. Not just know in your knower, but know in your heart. And that makes a big difference. In 1 Kings chapter 18, Elisha, he had just had an amazing victory on Mount Carmel. Remember when he proves to the prophets of Baal that their God is dead? He said, shout louder, maybe he's asleep. And so they did all this frantic stuff desperately so that their God, Baal, could bring fire from heaven and consume the sacrifice that was there. Elisha, what does he do? He makes it even more wet. He pours bucket after bucket after bucket on a sacrifice and he just prays once and boom, it's consumed just like that. Everyone knew the one true God was Elisha's God. It wasn't Baal. It doesn't mean they didn't like the outcome, especially King Ahab and Jezebel when they found out. Jezebel, she was really ticked and she gave a death threat to Elisha that Put them on the run. You can read about it in 1 Kings chapter 18. Then in 1 Kings chapter 19, Elisha, he's afraid. He's on the run. He's hiding in the cave. He's feeling sorry for himself. He just wants to die. And that's his prayer. And the Lord finds Elisha and tells him to go stand on the mountain in the presence of the Lord who is about to go by. And this is his experience. The Lord wasn't in the wind, as powerful as that was. The Lord wasn't in the earthquake. Can you imagine? The Lord wasn't in the fire. None of those three things. But it was a still, small voice. How loud is the still, small voice? It's louder than the wind. It's louder than the earthquake. It's louder than the fire. It's loud and clear because it speaks to the heart. It speaks to his need. It creates that quiet place. It's what Elijah needed. Not something big and loud, but quiet and personal. And that still small voice is what Elijah needed to keep going, to be renewed, and to move on with hope. And here's the question. Can you be quiet enough to hear God's voice? Maybe even while I'm I'm still preaching and I'm about to be finished. God is God, whether you believe that or not. He's not a figment of your imagination. He's not a made-up God. He's not a pretend God. He is God. He's not created, but he's the creator, and he makes himself known. Romans chapter 1 tells us that even creation speaks of a creator. Man is without excuse. I love the sunsets in Godridge, don't you? 
And oftentimes you probably do drive down to just enjoy the sunset. Maybe you've had a crazy busy day and you just need to get to the water. Enjoy that sunset. Think, pray, just be quiet. And the sun goes down and you think, you know what? That was a good day in spite of what happened. And tomorrow is going to be another day. Creation speaks of a creator that all man is without excuse. See, knowing God is what life is all about. Be still and know. Someone said this, the acronym, no God, no peace, K-N-O-W. But if you have no God, if you don't know him, then you won't have peace. It's true, isn't it? If you don't know God, you're missing out on life, eternal life, abundant life, a life planned that he wants you to live and know him, not just in your head, but by experience. My prayer is that next time you find yourself in a tight spot, that you need a refuge, you need a fortress. You, you find yourself so busy and there's so many questions and you don't know what to do that you will pray and you will come to this place, be still and know that he is God. I'm going to close with a little different approach. Would you stand with me? And we're going to read scripture this morning in closing. I'm going to ask you to, to read the scripture out loud. I made the font a little larger. And if you just can't see it, that's fine. You could uh, follow along. So it's the next set of scriptures there, Daryl. And what's on my computer may not match there, so I'm going to look at the back screen and read it. But let's read it together with our big voice. This is a great way to encourage one another for God's word to come in. Just don't listen to it. Please, if you can, and if you feel comfortable, speak it out loud as a prayer. We're going to pray scripture. Here we go. Cast all your anxiety on him because he cares for you. You will keep him in perfect peace, those whose minds are steadfast, because they trust in you. Trust in the Lord forever. For the Lord, the Lord himself, is the rock eternal. When you lie down, you will not be afraid. When you lie down, your sleep will be sweet. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled and do not be afraid. The Lord is close to the brokenhearted and saves those who are crushed in spirit. Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. The Lord gives strength to his people. The Lord blesses his people with peace. When I am afraid, I put my trust in you. Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, Think about such things, and the God of peace will be with you. In the same way, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. We do not know what we ought to pray for, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us through wordless groans. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you, and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. He who dwells in the shelter of the Most High will abide in the shadow of the Almighty. I will say to the Lord, my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust, he will cover you with his feathers, and under his wings you will find refuge." But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. So do not fear for I am with you. Do not be dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you and help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. 
I lift my eyes to the hills. Where does my help come from? My help comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. He will not let your foot slip. He who watches over you will not slumber. Indeed, he who watches over Israel will neither slumber nor sleep. The Lord watches over you. The Lord will keep you from all harm. He will watch over your life. Let's bow in a word of prayer. Father, we're so thankful for your word that we can read it, that we can hear others uh, quoting it as well as we do this together as a congregation. I thank you, Jesus, that you are the living word. So by your spirit, do what needs to be done in our lives. Quiet us, even in this moment. Help us to trust you. Help us to look up. Where does my help come from? My help comes from you. You are a refuge. You are a fortress. You are that, that place that we just need to experience in quietness the fullness of who you are. And then to be encouraged to go out and be what you want us to be as we trust you, as we walk daily as we live our life for you, as we let our light show shine before men that they may see our good works and glorify our Father that is in heaven. So God, I pray for each person. Maybe they're carrying those burdens even yet. Maybe they're going through a season that is just so difficult. Maybe they just don't know what to do. Help them to pray. We don't know what to do, but we're looking to you. Our eyes are focused on you. I know that you love us. I know that you care for each and every one of us. I know that you do things even in the background that we aren't even aware of it. But you never fail us. You are always with us and you are for us. So I just thank you. Holy Spirit, just speak to the whole person today. Touch them, body, soul, spirit, and mind. Give them the strength from you to live for you. That others may know you and experience that wonderful quietness of sins forgiven of a hope that will carry us through the most difficult times. And we ask this all in Jesus' name. And everyone said, Amen. Amen. God bless you. Have a wonderful weekend.